Well, well, well. What an absolute phenomenal episode we have in store for you today. Happy Monday and a welcome back, my Freedom Pack family. Today on the show, we are joined by the current rock star in the field of genetics and anti-aging. It is Professor David Sinclair. David is a professor in the Department of Genetics and is the co-director of the Paul F. Glenn Center for the Biology of Aging at the Harvard Medical School. The primary concern of David's work is that of aging, why we age, how we slow it down, and also how to reverse the effects of aging. Dr. Sinclair is the co-founder of multiple biotech companies, is on the board of directors for several others, and is also the co-founder of the Medical Science Journal, which is aptly named Aging. David's work has been featured in five books, two documentaries, 60 Minutes, and also on Morgan Freeman's Through the Wormhole feature, as well as various other media. David is the owner of over 35 patents. David has received more than 25 awards, including Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World, not bad, the Australian Commonwealth Prize, the Bio Innovator Award, Top 100 Australian Innovators, the CSL Prize, and the Thompson Prize, to name a few. So, as you can see, this guy is a fucking big deal. The podcast David did very recently with Joe Rogan was at number two worldwide. David's also just released a fantastic book called Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. I read the book last week. I've already been applying the concepts in it to my own life. I highly, highly recommend you pick it up. So as you can guess, this episode will be all around the science of aging, the strategies we can use to prevent it. I highly recommend you guys listen to the full thing. It's just a mind-blowing conversation. So, Before we jump into today's episode, could I just ask you for a favor? This would honestly mean the world to me. So, as you guys know, we are always trying to expand the show to get more guests on, to get more visibility. So, it would mean the absolute world to me if you could leave us a iTunes rating and a review. I would really appreciate it. So without any further ado, Professor David Sinclair, welcome to the Freedom Pact. Joe, it's great to be on. Thanks for having me. It is such a pleasure. So I finished your book two nights ago. What I really, really admired about your book is that I've read a lot of books and A lot of them, they start off really great, but I always get the feeling that at certain points in books, it sort of enters into this page filler effect where you know that the writer has to meet a certain criteria set by publishers, but your book is just relentlessly packed with information after information. I wouldn't be surprised if put everything you know into that book. So it was just such a great read. So I thank you so much for writing it. Well, that's kind of you to say. Um, I did put a lot into it. Um, and you're right. It, it is filled with a lot of information. Ho- hopefully you, it's a page turner. I, I feel that it is. And I still don't get bored reading it myself. I always discover new things that are in there that I, I put in there. Because it, it just with one read, you, you, there's, there's way too much to absorb. And it's not just the facts. What I wanted to do is to blow people's minds, to think about their lives differently. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that that was one of the things you took away as well. 
Well, I think considering that the only time I've ever heard around this topic of anti-aging, of genetics, and really thought about it is through yourself. When I think about it, it's just such a startling concept, really. I was reading the book and I was thinking, I'm 23 and I looked in the mirror and I can start to see grey hairs appearing. (laughs) So should should I be worried, David? Well, grey hair is not going to kill you, uh, so don't worry about that. Uh, But what we're learning is that ageing begins uh, even before birth. Uh, I read a, a, a paper this morning. I wasn't even out of bed, and I'm reading papers. Imagine that. <laughs> and, and it said that uh, babies who are over, overfed with breast milk have an accelerated aging. Um, uh, this is mice, not, not humans. But, but it, it tells you that even in your 20s, you're getting older, and the way you live your life probably determines whether you're going to be healthy in your 80s and 90s or not. So you just mentioned there that, you know, you're not even out of bed and you're reading papers. I mean, just how passionate are you about this subject? Uh, Well, for me, it's everything. Um, I'm single minded about leaving this world a better place than I found it. And since I was four, I've wanted to work on this topic. I got a Ph.D. in molecular genetics to make this possible. Uh, Trained at MIT. I'm at Harvard. So I'm extremely lucky to be in a position now where I can impact the world by making discoveries, but also I felt the need to wake the world up. Uh, I find that uh, I, I think about the world very differently, that aging is something that even though it's natural, we don't need to accept it. We can use technology to extend our healthy lives dramatically, actually. And so that's what this book is. It's my uh, it's my passion. Uh, it's my gift to the world. I hope uh, people enjoy it um, because I, I've for all my whole, all my life, I've found I've thought differently than just about everyone I've met on the planet. What is David Sinclair's motivation? I mean, what do you hope to achieve by the time that your time does come round? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm always honest. That's one of my my the things I live by. And so the the truth is that um, I I've achieved more than I was hoping in my life. So everything else is a bonus, but it doesn't mean I'm letting off the the accelerator pedal at all. In fact, I now have have more impetus, more motivation to to keep going even harder, build bigger teams, make bigger discoveries, reach more people, and hopefully make medicines that will will change the world. But but I think I've already um, exceeded what I was hoping. You know, if you ask me now, really, what I I hope to do from this point here, it's to have at least one medicine that can not just treat one disease such as diabetes or prevent cancer or treat Alzheimer's, but one that if you take it will treat all causes of aging and slow that process down so that your drug for diabetes will prevent cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, frailty, and give you longer life as well. Wow. Do you have a sort of timeline for that? Uh, Well, drugs are really hard, and I've been working on them since I was 34. I'm now 50. So it's not an easy thing, and it costs hundreds of millions or more to do that. Uh, but I have a number of irons in the fire. I've helped many of my colleagues start companies. I've started out of my own lab. I'm probably six or seven. Uh, four of them have gone public. So it's it's been a great ride. But the ultimate goal is to, to have a medicine on the market that p- can be prescribed. Um, there are a few of, few of the companies that I have started or I work with that are in clinical trials right now. They're early stage. They're phase one, um, heading into phase two, which means phase two is when you find out if they actually work or not, or seem to work. And so over the next few years, uh, I hope that I'll be able to uh, tell the world that we've had some some signs in small groups of people, 40, 50 people, that we are actually so far successful. That's my own contribution, but many of my colleagues have also um, started companies or or made inventions that are being turned into medicines so even if i get hit by a bus after this this podcast someone i think will will make it and it's just the beginning it, this is like the wright brothers we've learned how to fly the the glider we're strapping on the engines we know how flight works it's mathematically obvious and it's just a matter of time before we have a concorde and even fly to the moon you mentioned being hit by a bus for there. 
I told our email newsletter that you were coming on and one of the overwhelming questions which I was asked was something along the lines of why is this guy so afraid to die? <laughs> so do you get asked that question a lot and can you confirm whether you are afraid to die? It's a total misconception. Um, it might seem like that, but uh, if, if they the person would read my book, they would mm. know from the bottom of my heart that I'm not afraid to die at all. Um, in fact, I've, I've thought many times that I was going to die. I fly a lot. And on many occasions, there have been times when the plane has had malfunctions and couldn't land or the flaps weren't working. Um, I don't get scared of dying at all. In fact, it's my wife that's clinging to my shoulder and squeezing my <laughs> my arm till, I, till the blood stopped flowing. Um, so it's not driven by anything about myself. I'm, I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing it because I think it's the most important thing we can do for humanity. And it's not just about health care. It's about saving trillions of dollars that is currently, I think, wasted on keeping people um, alive in a, in a state that is really not anything you'd wish on your enemies. And that's money that can be spent on other pressing issues that we've we've got on our hands, like uh, dealing with global warming and saving endangered species. Yeah. So there's just so, so much to, to delve into. So if we just take this, uh, you know, just one step back. So I feel as if your work, you know, anyone that comes into it, I'm sure that it will resonate in so, you know, with someone I went on the podcast charts a couple of days ago. I saw you at number two or three in the world on the Joe Rogan experience. It may very well have reached number one. So I can only imagine the sort of impact which it is having. So if we just take a step a step back, I mean, you mentioned it for, what was it that actually brought you into this field of anti-aging? It was uh, my grandmother initially. She told me that... Um, nobody sticks around uh, and that my pet cat will die and then she would die uh, and then my parents would die. She's a, she was a fairly brutal uh, and honest grandmother. Uh, she was very young actually when uh, I was born. She was in her early 40s. So she was much like a mother to me. Um, and I had huge respect for her. Uh, she was a humanitarian, uh, a humanist, and uh, everything she said to me was was gospel. And one thing she said to me, uh, was David, uh, humans have screwed up things. Uh, she said, I've lived through World War II and the aftermath in Europe. I escaped to Australia. What you need to do with your life is to stay young because adults screw up everything. And it's, what she meant was mentally stay young. Uh, and then she said, please show humanity that they can be better than they have been. Uh, don't repeat the 20th century's mistakes. Be someone who makes a difference in a positive way. Uh, and I, I live by that. That's what I do every time I, I wake up in the morning. I suppose what she's sort of referring to then is the difference between our health age and our biological or our chronological age. Is that, is that what, I'm, what I'm hearing? Well, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is to delay uh, all major diseases. Um, and that, that's a big, going to be a big impact. What's not appreciated, even by doctors is if we cured any major disease today let's take cancer for example if someone had a magic medicine that could cure every type of cancer which everyone would would be you know you, you'd win nobel prizes for that it would only extend the average average lifespan by two and a half years and the reason is that all of our all of the processes that are going on to cause aging uh, which i think we understand in large part now they're all going up exponentially so that even if you don't get cancer, you're going to get heart disease, have a heart attack or a stroke um, or some other horrible uh, disease anyway. And the only way that we can go beyond our quote unquote natural lifespan now, because we've basically done everything else, fresh water, vaccines, uh, is to address the underlying problem. And that is aging. Is aging then a is there a disease? Is there a condition? Is there a symptom? Well, it, it's like a lot of diseases. There are many different symptoms. Um, the number of symptoms doesn't matter. Um, there are some very complex diseases. Cancer is hundreds of different types of disease. 
the difference between a disease and aging is that if something happens to 49.9% of us as we get older, we call it a disease because it's rare. But if it's common, if it happens to 51% of us or even 50.1% of us, we just call that aging. And I argue in my book that that's the wrong way to think about things, that just drawing a 50% cutoff is totally arbitrary. And just because we will eventually get this, these symptoms uh, doesn't make it any less important, and it sure doesn't make it acceptable. A hundred years ago, we used to think it was acceptable to die during childbirth or from an infected splinter. We no longer do. We understood what causes those things. We prevent them in large part. The same is going to be true for aging in, I think, in the not too distant future. How are organizations like, let's say, the World Health Organization, how much of much are they adapting to this research? Where, where are they at in, the, in this whole process? Yeah, well, so that there's another reason for, for writing the book is that this can't just happen from from the science upwards. It has to come from the top down. Organizations uh, like the World Health Organiza- uh, Organization, WHO, are p- starting to play their role in this. Um, governments as well. I've been talking to leaders in the UK, uh, US, Israel, Singapore, Australia. And, uh, but the World Health Organization is, is an interesting one because they are, uh, they have huge respect uh, for me. That They are pioneers in the way to think about aging. And, and they have this, uh, what's called the ICD-11 booklet, which is a code of diseases. Now it's gone over the last hundred or so years from a couple of hundred diseases now to 14,000 different diseases that you can be diagnosed with across the planet. But they've added a new one, and it's a very interesting one. It's called old age. Uh, and I think somebody snuck it in when nobody was looking. But the fact that it's now ratified, um, and this is going to be the, the new standard for doctors in uh, looking at different conditions and reporting on those, uh, is is a real step forward. It doesn't mean yet that your doctor can prescribe something to treat or to slow down aging. Uh, we're not there yet. But I think it's a really big step forward. So does anyone actually die of old age? No, they don't. Um, they die of the symptoms of old age. Um, if, you, if you smoke, you're going to increase your chance of cancer by fivefold, which is horrible. My mother uh, was a victim. If you age from 20 to 70, like most of us will or have, your chance of getting cancer goes up a thousandfold. So when you die of cancer you're typically, unless you're young, you're dying from an, a symptom of aging. Wow. I'm just thinking in terms of age-related disease. So do you think that coming forth now into this, into these next coming years, there will be greater steps taken from organizations like the WHO, the World Health Organization, to maybe adopt a more preventative approach Yes, without a doubt. And it's partly based on perception that we can prevent the the diseases of aging, uh, push them out further and perhaps compact them, compress them to the last few years of life, if not shorter than that. So that it's a perception. The other is technology. We now have watches, we have blood tests, we have a ring like the one I'm wearing here that tells us how we're doing during the day. And the, the idea of going to the doctor once a year for a physical is, is already a laughable thing. Um, and now that we can measure these things, we can actually uh, optimize our bodies and keep ourselves healthy um, well before a disease takes hold. Now, one of the big breakthroughs is that we can now take blood. So, Joe, I could take a blood sample from you and I could tell you how old you are biologically Forget about birthday candles. That's fairly irrelevant. I could tell you if you're if you're younger or older than that. And I could also, therefore, predict when you are going to die very accurately. Wow. And what is that? That's a bit scary, right? Mm-hmm. But the good news is, first of all, you can change the course of this clock. You can slow it down. We know that things like intermittent fasting, um, healthy lifestyle exercise will slow that progression. But more importantly, the fact that we can now measure age accurately biological age means that we will know if drugs are working to slow it down. And when doctors can measure things with a blood test, for example, 
I think they'll become more comfortable with the idea of treating the progression of, of this, what I call a disease. I think it would be really helpful if you could just sort of link the effects between aging and disease because i've heard you say that you don't get cancer at a young age you don't get dementia at a young age you don't get these things it's as you get older does that mean then that aging is sort of the the base level of the pyramid yes it certainly is now there are other things that cause diseases cancer uh, mutations occur over time but you can get mutations when you're young but you don't get get the cancer until much later if you get a sun sunburn, and I was an Aussie kid and got plenty of it, it I didn't get cancer the next day after my sunburn. It's going to happen 40, 50 years later. Why is that? It's because aging is happening, okay? And if we didn't age, if we could reset the clock, and I think we have a good idea how to do that now, those mutations, that sunburn or that x-ray that you had as a kid wouldn't necessarily lead to cancer. Okay, and that's a whole new way of thinking about disease. And it's not just time. What's happening over that time is that I believe that cells are losing their function because they cannot read the genes in the right way that they did when they were young. And I call this the information theory of aging. I'd love to know just in terms of, you know, the science and the research that you've done with this. Was there a case of researching people which were at, say, uh, at a, an old age and sort of looking at lifestyle factors for them? Was that a part of the research process? Uh, yes. Yeah, so my field is fairly small, but still there's hundreds of labs doing this. And uh, I'm a small part of that uh, to, you know, to be honest and, and, and suitably humble. I don't do a lot of human research besides clinical trials. But there are some really great studies that looked at lifestyle. Um, there's Dan Butner's Blue Zones, but there's many others, Okinawa. Um, my friend Nir Barzilai, who works at, uh, in New York at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, he studies centenarian families. What do they do that allows them to live longer? And what they've learned, what we've learned as a field, is that 20% of your longevity, how healthy you are, say, at age 80, is genetically determined. Only 20%. That's stunning. I, w I would have thought it would be 80% because I'm a geneticist. Um, although I'm s very rapidly ev evolving my thoughts into what you might call an epigeneticist. Because the other 80% is dictated by what we call the epigenome, which are, are the structures, the systems in the cell that read the genome in the right way. Or as we get older, I would say in the wrong way. Now, Joe, you, you, you asked me what does that mean in terms of lifestyle? Well, we know that the clock, uh, the epigenetic clock that we measure um, and the advancement of age uh, is accelerated by things like uh, a lot of DNA damage. So I would avoid sun, sunburn, uh, too many x-rays, a lot of CT scans that are, if they're unnecessary, often they are, uh, as well as intermittent fasting. Being hungry extends the lifespan and slows aging in many different species, probably us as well. Um, exercise we know has been good for you, but we now understand why it activates the body's defenses and slows down these epigenetic changes. Um, and there are also now molecules that have some have come from my lab's research, some that are already on the market as medicines that we also believe can slow down aging and prevent cancer, heart disease and frailty as well, just with a single pill. What do you think in terms of the actual lifespan of a species because i know there are things like the giant tortoise for example i think there's like one recorded which lives to like 250 is there any reason why we have to die at say 78 not at all that one of the the main arguments i make uh in chapter two of my book is uh, there is no biological limit anyone who says that we are predestined to live only 80 years uh, doesn't know what they're talking about now, we have a certain genome that I, I believe has evolved over many, many millions of years. Um, but no matter how you think we got our genome, it's not perfect. It's built to just allow us sufficient time to reproduce so that our genes can pass on. We don't have to. Richard Dawkins will tell you that. Um, big fan of his, uh, his book, The Selfish Gene. And uh, but the, the point of, of all of this is that the... The body can live longer if you just know how to tweak it. 
um, beyond what is natural. And if I would argue if someone's think, thinking this, uh, that natural is good, uh, what about our lives right now that, that's natural? I mean, I'm standing here at a desk with a supercomputer essentially in front of me, nine floors off the street in an air-conditioned building. If you're in an airplane, you're flying in a seat at 900 kilometers per hour. None of our world is natural. Um, and if, if you want to go back to being natural, um, good luck with that. You'll get, get eaten by a wild animal over in Africa. <laughs> you to that. Um, so, yeah, so d- the natural argument doesn't doesn't pan out but or doesn't hold water. But also what's important, and you mentioned, Joe, importantly, there are many species on the planet, um, bristlecone pines, uh, Greenland shark, tortoises, uh, and even warm-blooded animals such as whales that live longer than we do. 200 even more years of age now if they can do it and we're very close cousins with whales very similar genomes why can't we there it's not impossible and we're now starting to understand what separates us from a whale how do they get to avoid cancer and heart attacks for 200 years and we don't and it should be able to be possible with very little effort uh, ultimately i would say a pill or two a day to be able to allow us to live much longer like those other species that have had the luck of evolution on their side. So I'm 23 now. If I keep rereading your book, if I keep listening back to your podcast, is it possible I could live to 150, 200, 500? Uh, well, that's like asking uh, the Wright brothers how how long till we get to the moon. Is it possible? <laughs> uh, I think it's 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 all possible. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. Science moves ahead one step at a time. But I can see with research that's going on around the world that we've passed a turning point, that we're no longer just guessing how to live longer. We actually understand the equivalent of wind speed and airflow, um, but for aging. And I can throw numbers out. I I would be surprised if, if we don't that, that children who are born now and live to the 20th, 22nd century, if they don't live another decade longer than we do with the kind of technologies that I see coming online and molecules already, as I mentioned, that are, that are available. Um, but it, it's not easy. Trying to extend people's lives by an extra year or two is already extremely difficult. And countries are pouring billions of dollars into healthcare to be able to do that. But I think with a new approach to healthcare, a new approach to medicine, we will see Uh, a breakthrough in our lifetimes. What would that approach look like? Well, I would continue working on current diseases. I'm not saying uh, that that's not a good thing, but um, given how much money we here in the U.S. spend on one fighter jet, or or for that matter, on coffee, hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, this could be money well spent if we use some of that to understand the aging process and to develop medicines that would tackle it What's important to understand, I, as I make the point in my book, is the, the this technology, the, this understanding of aging, isn't just about treating the elderly. Uh, in fact, it's 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 quite the opposite. It's about being able to prevent common diseases and rare diseases alike. The technologies that we have on hand um, in the labs right now, and hopefully soon in in uh, the doctor's office, uh, are having remarkable effects on on diseases uh, such as mitochondrial dysfunction, which are rare genetic diseases, and loss of eyesight in the case of glaucoma, macular degeneration, heart attacks. It crosses the whole spectrum of what kills us and what ails us and reduces our quality of life. And although you know I, I'm called a, an aging researcher and I'm, I am aging, um, it's p- important to think of this more like a, a new approach to m- fundamental medicine than just about treating old age. And so I I think that this whack-a-mole medicine, as I call it in the book, where we try to stop one disease and and just have another one pop up a few years later, um, it's it's been a fine approach. We shouldn't stop, but it's not going to get us as far as a a planet, as a species, uh, than if we tried a new approach, which is to get at the root cause of most of these diseases. You mentioned the elderly people were there. I just wonder in this research, how, have you ever faced any maybe ethical questions in terms of 
I imagine the po- the population is probably quite overpopulated at the minute. Have you ever faced any sort of questions like that? Uh, yeah, all the time uh, when I give talks, the, the f- first question that pops into people's minds often is, um, what are you going to do to the planet, David? Are you going to leave this uh, planet overcrowded and, and lack of food, lack of water? Um, and so what I do in, in my book is to to go through various scenarios based on fact, based on modeling, and uh, and have a look at what the future is like 20, 50, 100 years from now if we're not successful, if we continue doing medicine the way we currently do it, um, and if we are successful, what does that world look like? And there are some positives and negatives. Uh, you know, I'm not wearing uh, totally rose-colored glasses here, uh, but but what's very clear, and it's a mathematical near certainty, is that it will not lead to massive overpopulation on the planet. The, the math just doesn't add up, even if we stopped people dying today, and I, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Uh, the population growth wouldn't go up dramatically. There aren't that many old people dying, actually, and that's the problem, is that, they're, that we're having more and more older people who are not productive and costing us young people uh, more and more money to keep them going. Um, and actually, the world population may level off between 10 and 11 billion people, and that's that's UN project, projection. Some people think it'll level off sooner than that. I was just over in Uganda where the size of the families has dropped from an average of eight down to about three to five, and often people having two kids now. And that's in one of the world's fastest growing nations. I think that that's going to be the future where most of the developing world is is like us. We have between one and two kids, populations declining in most of Europe and uh, in Japan. And uh, I think that we'll end up at an equilibrium. um, And I'm not worried about population growth. What I'm excited about is freeing up trillions of dollars that can be used to tackle other problems. The question, what are you doing to the planet, David? I mean, how does that question make you feel personally? Um, I like discussion. I'm, I'm a born debater. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm a teacher at Harvard medical school. Uh, my job is to, uh, de ignorify people, uh, to educate them. And I, I don't mind if people don't know things. I don't know, you know, a lot of things, uh, in the world, but I do appreciate people who take the time to explain things clearly, uh, and, and list, are open to other people's views. And so, yeah, I, I would love it if people ask me more questions, even if um, they might be ignorant of the answer. And okay. I, yeah. what I hope is it with the book that that people think, uh, and there is no proof that the future is the way I've laid it out. We'll we'll have to see. But what I do know is that by talking about it, uh, it'll be important because we need to get ready for what's coming. And what I I truly believe is that these medicines and these approaches that we've uncovered will change the course of people's lives and it will impact society in positive and negative ways. Are there any crazy, just out there, maybe really like hateful comments or ignorant comments that you've had? Are there, are there any favorites? Oh yes. Uh, so the, the book, um, I'm very, uh, humbled by the book doing so well so far. Uh, it's her- I want to cheer for science and logic in this world of a lot of uh, misinformation. Uh, so the book's done very well, and I, I'm reading, and I probably shouldn't, but I'm reading the comments that people are leaving online. Um, so please, if you've read the book, and especially if you liked it, uh, please leave a comment. I'm, I'm reading them all. There was one, uh, and by the way, it was at five stars on on uh, one of the world's leading uh, bookstores, um, and it just reached the New York Times bestseller list. So I'm very pleased and thankful for everybody who's read it. Um, but one comment was, uh, I got three stars for the book and Helen, Helena was her name, is her name. She wrote, uh, the book won't get to the point. He keeps talking about evolution, which is a disproven theory and boring anyway. <laughs> uh, even if, if you're, if you're a Christian, that's fine. I, um, religious, there's things for religious people in the book. I quote, a passage from the Bible, so that's fine. I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, totally uh, just a pure scientist. I, I am looking at the history of the world, philosophically, socially, economically, 
and there's something for everybody. Um, though I have to concede that uh, I can't ignore evolution or I'd be kicked out of Harvard Medical School. <laughs> So, so you read that, can't I mean, do you, do you laugh? Do you cry? Do you screenshot it and send it to your wife? What, what, what do you, how do you respond? Um, it's fine. Uh, as a scientist, you, you learn to have a thick skin because it's in our job. We're, we're attacked every day uh, for our ideas, and it's all part of the debate. I'm totally open to everybody having their own ideas. Although, you know, I, I would love to have a high, high rating on my book, but... Um, I know that there's going to be people who disagree with me, and that's totally fine. The fact that Helena read the book is more important to me than the fact that she uh, agreed or disagreed. Exactly. So now, this is the bit that I've been so excited for. Let's delve into some preventative strategies for aging. So I know that you are a big proponent of caloric restriction. So could we just delve into the sort of science behind it, what you know, and what that would look like in terms of a daily practice? Yeah. Right, Joe. Um, I want your listeners to know that I have, for the first time, listed what I and my father, wife, and brother do on a daily basis, uh, down to even the the yogurt that I, I take in the morning. Um, but yeah, let's get to the, the nuts and bolts of, of what I'm talking about. Now, you'll remember that my information theory of aging um, is at the crux of trying to explain why a lot of things go wrong in our bodies. And it's the, I think it's the inability of cells to read their genes at the right time. The analogy that, one of the analogies that I, I use in the book is the, the DVD um, information, the, the pits in the DVD, which is the beautiful symphony, the music of our lives is the same as the DNA in our cells. And what we've realized is that, it, that the information on the DVD or the DNA in our cells is essentially intact. The information to be young is still in someone who's old, but it's as if the DVD has been scratched so that the, the reader cannot read the symphony and it's playing the, the, the tunes, the songs, and the, the concerto in the, in the wrong order, and it's a mess. Same thing I think is going on with our cells. They don't read the genes at the right time. So what we want to do is to uh, delay that process of the scratching of the, the DVD, as it were. And one of the best ways, I think, to do that is to activate the body's defenses against aging. We actually have genes and what we call uh, genetic pathways, biochemical pathways that take care of us, but they become complacent. They, uh, If you uh, sit around, you eat a lot, your longevity genes, as we call them, will not be hyperactive. In fact, they'll essentially shut down uh, to try and preserve energy. And we, the, the genes that we work on have a name. They're called sirtuins. The sir is inf in, interesting because it stands for silent information regulator. Again, this information theory of aging. So what do, you, what do I recommend? I, I, what we've shown in many studies in my lab and others is that being hungry is good for you. Now, that's not malnutrition. It's certainly not starvation. Please don't do that to yourself. You know, and eating disorders are not going to make you live longer. But if you skip a meal or two during the day um, and eat a, a larger meal late in the, later in the day, that is a, a way that uh, many people, myself included, believe can activate our longevity genes and slow down the, the pace of aging and the scratching of the DVD. Uh, that's what I do. I try to. I, I mentioned yogurt in the morning. I have a couple of spoonfuls just to, to get going. But the rest of the day, up until, if I'm lucky, about eight o'clock at night, seven to eight o'clock, uh, I'm I'm not eating. Um, if if I'm really uh, hungry and I can't stand it, I go and get a bit of lunch. That's fine. A bit of salad, maybe a bit of sushi. Uh, but really, it's not as much about what you eat, as when you eat. And uh, that's that's been a breakthrough in the last few years. Now, that doesn't mean that you can just go and eat um, you know, terrible food and high fructose corn syrup and expect to get away with it. Not at all. But we used to think that it was what you ate more than when, but it's been flipped on its head. Wow. Wow. What do you know about the, the what versus when? Could you just delve into that a little bit more? That, yeah, yeah. So this is uh, 25 years of my lab's research and many others um, collaborating with us. 
the what we've discovered using simple organisms like yeast cells for, for making beer and bread and uh, and wine. We, we've studied those cells. We've also now studied mice, and we've got a lot of data from from humans as well. So what I'm going to tell you is is really really well established in the world's top scientific journals. What we've realized is that when you're hungry or you've exercised, uh, you'll turn on these longevity pathways. There are three main players. Uh, I work on the sirtuins, as I mentioned. There are a couple of others. One's called AMPK, and that responds to low energy in the body. And there's a third one called TOR, and TOR responds to having low amounts of amino acids and, and low protein. And together they form this surveillance network in our bodies, keeping us healthy, stabilizing our epigenome, stopping the scratches from occurring. And practically, we think keeping us super fit, super healthy, and free of cancer and all those other diseases of aging. And uh, though we, we haven't proven that any of these extend human lifespan, there are some studies looking at the genetic variants in humans of these genes, as well as uh, a drug such as metformin, which is a diabetes drug that can be prescribed for type 2 diabetes that seems to prevent diseases beyond just type 2 diabetes, such as cancer and heart disease and uh, frailty and even Alzheimer's. So all of that put together says that um, if we put our bodies in a state of adversity or perceived adversity, and that can be hunger, it can be exercise, so you want to be running every few days, getting puffed for at least 10 minutes to get your body out of that complacency state. Um, and there are some other things that I talk about in the book that are also potential uh, ways to boost the body's defenses. Being really hot in a sauna seems to be beneficial for health, possibly through these same mechanisms. And dunking in a cold bath, uh, shocking your body also improves the production of what's called br uh, brown fat. And brown fat is uh, thought to be very healthy as well and also involves the sirtuin genes we work on. But together, what I'm saying is you've got to be a little bit uncomfortable. You've got to wake your body up to get the full benefits of these longevity pathways that we work on. So just in terms of you personally, I mean, what other practices do you use? You mentioned metformin. I've heard you talk about that you take that. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine there's some sort of intermittent fasting, which you yeah. previously mentioned. But so what else is it which you do? Right. Um, well, there's a lot. So um, turn to page uh, part three of the book if you're really interested. The, the, the staple are molecules that I've studied in my lab. And I, I have a... Um, a, sometimes a 10-year advanced view of, of the, the, the data in humans and animals. So I can often make a decision personally about whether it's worth taking a molecule or not and if it's safe or not. And so I've made a personal choice to, to try to see what happens um, if I take a combination of three molecules. Excuse me. Uh, the first one that I took going back starting in 2004 – uh, is called resveratrol, the molecule that is found in red wine. And uh, your listeners might remember that we discovered resveratrol activated anti-aging pathways back in, back in those days and protected mice from a high-fat diet um, and actually in combination with fasting made them live uh, longer, both average and a maximum. And so that was, that was the first thing. The next one is an NAD booster. Uh, NAD is a molecule in the body that is essential for life. Without it, we'd be dead in 30 seconds or less. And NAD is important because it's needed for these sirtuin longevity um, pathways to work. Without NAD, they don't protect us. And so as we get older, we think that we have less and less NAD. And by taking an NAD precursor molecule, in my case, I, I, I'm taking NMN every morning, that NMN molecule is raising NAD in my body and hopefully keeping me in a, a hyper vigilant state metabolically and, and physiologically. And then the third one uh, is metformin. Joe, you mentioned that metformin being the diabetes drug. Now that one is a little more out there because it's it's called a drug, but it's essentially a derivative derivative of a of a lilac. It's not that crazy. But because it in in the UK and in the US uh, it's it needs a prescription it's harder to get. Now, there are many countries in the world. I was just in Uganda and I've been in Thailand where you can just go to the chemist and buy it. It's 
over-the-counter drug, over-the-counter molecule. So it's it's clearly uh, not super dangerous, um, and it's actually listed by I think it's the World Health Organization as one of the the top essential drugs on the planet. Um, but again, it's it's not easy to come by. More and more doctors are learning about the data and and the potential of this drug to help before you get diabetes, and more and more are prescribing it for people who are getting older and don't want to get diabetes or these other diseases. For more on this, I highly, highly recommend everybody checks David's book out, which is on this. Just swipe up on this episode. So I when, when we put out uh, a question to our newsletter, I think we had 138 emails back with potential questions to you coming on the show. And besides the ones like, why is he so afraid to die? There were so many in there related to exercise. So I've been dying, no pun intended, to ask you about exercise. What do you think is the optimal strategy? Is it is it cardio, running routine? Is it weightlifting, powerlifting, bodybuilding? Where, where do you stand on this? Well, in a word, yes. Um, <laughs> and I, I, lit, I literally stand. Uh, I'm at a standing desk right now. Uh, I stand at a desk. I always move. Uh, I very rarely sit unless I'm writing a book, which almost destroyed my, my the muscles in my hips, which I had had to fix. But uh, now I'm back to normal. Uh, I go to the gym uh, not as often as I want, but because I'm often working till midnight. But um, I do go as much as I can. Uh, what I do is I I go for three hours on a Sunday with my son. Highly recommend going with your children. It's the really great bonding experience. What we do is we do an hour of uh, weightlifting, deadlifts, strengthening the back, getting every muscle to to work. Uh, That will activate the longevity genes in the muscle and they'll communicate to the rest of the body that they need to to do a better job at surviving. Uh, So that's great, but it's not good enough. You need to also experience hypoxia, low oxygen. So you need to run on a treadmill for at least 10 minutes, get your breath uh, uh, make your breath short to the point where you could not carry out a conversation with somebody. And somewhere between 10 minutes and half an hour, I've read, is optimal. You don't need to be running marathons to get the benefit. That's the good news. Um, but I would do it more often than I do. I uh, I only do it exhaustively once a week. But uh, actually just this week, I've been better at it. Every night I'm going to the gym with my son um, because I, I need to make up for uh, a fairly uh, debaucherous uh, back in uh, holiday in Africa. But uh, that said, only a little bit goes a long way. Um, 10 minutes every few days should be make a world of difference. You can reduce your chance of getting uh, heart disease and dying from a heart attack between 20 and 40% by exercising. It's really quite an, an amazing effect. I also at the gym, uh, I go to the sauna, uh, and then I jump in a cold pool. And uh, although it's somewhat unpleasant, I do feel great afterwards at the very minimum, and it may also be helping activate my longevity genes in my skin and my brown fat. I just got four questions left that we ask all of our guests. So the first question is, we are a show rooted in action taking. So do you have a challenge of maybe two to three things that us and our audience can start doing today that is related to your work? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, let's see. If uh, if you're not already, uh, start moving. So go to, get on a treadmill, go for a walk, um, jog, get your pulse up um, a few times a week. That's step one. The other would be skip at least one meal a day. Don't lose too much weight. You don't need to lose a lot of weight, though if your BMI is more than 23, I recommend that you get down to that optimal range, which I describe in the book. Um, And then the third thing would be to get good sleep. Sleep is really important. I use my ring that I'm wearing. It's an aura ring. um, And it tells me if I've had a good night's sleep. And I've been able to find out what gives me a great night's sleep. Don't drink late at night, whether it's water, alcohol, both a problem, especially for older men. so I'm 
also not eating large meals late at night or snacking. That also stopped me from sleeping. But if you have good sleep, good exercise, um, and, and good eating patterns, you'll feel a million bucks and you might even live many years longer. And when you're 80 and still fit and healthy and you're starting a new career, uh, you might want to think about this podcast all those years ago. <laughs> you are now a very successful author yourself, as you mentioned, the success that it is the book has had, regardless of what Helena has to say. <laughs> um <laughs> Are there any books which have had a great impact on David Sinclair's life? Ah, oh, yes, there have been. Uh, so R Richard Dawkins, when I was in college, blew my mind because he's such a good communicator. Um, the Blind Watchmaker was a big one. Um, I, I like Malcolm Gladwell's earlier books. Uh, I like uh, Stephen Pinker's work on how the mind works. Uh, I had a really uh, emotional uh, reaction to the movie um, oh gosh now I'm blanking on it Dead Poets Society so Dead Poets Society uh, if you haven't seen it explains to a young group of boys that uh, they should look at this old photo on the wall of this high school and realize that they're all mortal and one day they will also be pushing up the daisies uh, and that was a big impact um, and then on the business side and life in general there's a book called The Black Swan, and it's it's at least 10 years old, but it's very apt today as well. And it's by a, a professor, I think he's at MIT, uh, Taleb is his last name, I believe. Nicholas and it, Taleb, is it? Yeah, great. And so what he says in that book is the key to success and an enjoyable life is to expose yourself to a lot of new things, a lot of chaos, and then have the the wisdom and the skill and the mentorship to find the jewels in that chaos to focus on. So for example, living in a city where there's lots of new people that you meet uh, will guarantee that you will have more opportunities than if you stay home and just watch TV every night. Wow. My next question to you is, are there any societal rules or societal norms that you love to break? Oh, well, just about everyone. Um, my my family gets upset because I, I tell my kids rules are meant to be broken and my wife you know, gives me the evil eye at that point. But um, let's see. Uh, what can I say publicly that I break? <laughs> All right. Uh, I've broken a few uh, road rules in my, in my time, but I'm not going to talk about that too much. Ah. <laughs> uh, Rules that I break. So I, I, I've broken a lot of rules as an academic. The rules of uh, don't over-communicate, don't speculate into the future that's not becoming of a scientist. I mean, I, my, my view is um, F that, really. The, the public has paid for, the, for this research. They deserve to know what's going on. They deserve to know my opinion and what, what I'm doing. Even in my personal life, I'm an open book. And, uh, and so there I've come under some criticism from my conservative colleagues who, who don't like that. Uh, and then starting companies as a scientist is also fairly frowned upon because it's considered a conflict of interest. But what I've discovered is if I'm not going to do it, it's unlikely anyone else will because there's this valley of death that investors get very nervous about. And you need to be able to take it from the lab into the clinic to get over that, uh, that very dangerous period. And you need a scientist like myself to be the champion of these ideas and the be the visionary my last question to you david is Im imagine a scenario where every person on this planet was tuned into the same th frequency and you could hypothetically give a short but impactful message to every person on the planet what would your message to the world be Uh, we're all in this together. Nobody gets out alive. Take risks. Do what you've always wanted to do. Don't worry if you fail. Everybody fails. Everyone makes mistakes. But if you continue doing what you love, you will be a success. Um, and don't listen to the naysayers. Everyone will always criticize you if you do something that's different. 
but in the end it will pay off beautiful message david where can our freedom pack family connect with you and where can they get the book uh well i i think the book's available wherever wherever books are sold um harper collins in the uk uh is publishing it it's available now uh and then uh, how they can reach me social media um very active um i have a book website it's called lifespanbook.com you can sign up for my newsletter on twitter i'm pretty active with uh, new science and new ideas and that's at david a sinclair a for andrew is my middle name uh, and instagram whenever i see something interesting around the world or bump into a an interesting person i'll post that along with uh, tips for life and that's uh instagram is david sinclair phd david, thanks Joe. david this was just a an absolute pleasure having you on the show and and i can't thank you enough for coming on well i'm grateful joe that you read the book um i'm chuffed that you you liked it as much as you did and it gives me hope that uh the world will change um, and change its attitude towards what i think is one of the biggest if not the biggest problems on our planet right now